It's a nice presentation by Shaheen uh, just now. And it was kind of interesting, one of the slides that she had up there kind of talked about the holdings that you see in a lot of these funds that are related to ESG. And it's kind of interesting to see that breakdown, Tom. You see a lot of holdings that are still kind of concentrated in big tech. And at the same time, kind of excluding a lot of, I guess, what we consider carbon uh, intensive industries, whether it's airlines, whether it's some of the oil and gas companies as well. But she also talked about the potential missed opportunity there if these companies indeed are transitioning to whatever our renewable energy future is going to look like. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key point. Uh, as some of the audience may know, we have a climate action plan that we developed a number of years ago. And, and the real focus of that plan is to examine our holdings from the perspective of transition readiness. Understanding that some of the companies uh, that folks might be concerned with their business practices today, the question really is where are they headed? Do they understand the imperative of the goals of the Paris Agreement? And what kind of business plans do they have in place to achieve those goals? And, and you know, from our perspective, again, being a pension fund, so and, and a large one, um, you know, our preference is to, to buy and hold, because right? mm -hmm. we're, we're a perpetual investor. We're not going out of business. We don't have really short-term interest. We have long-term interest, and we're well-funded, so we're very patient capital. So we view ourselves as being perpetual and universal. Uh, there are exceptions to it. There, you know, there are obviously some, some places we choose not to go to, but, um, you know, I'm looking at the list in that presentation, mm -hmm. uh, all those uh, company names are very familiar to me. How are you making decisions, though? I mean, when you sort of like go through your criteria for yeah. what sort of meets the standard of sustainability, what meets the standard for the E, the S, and the G, yeah. how do you go about that process? Well, you know, I know this is such a hot topic and obviously the focus of the summit, but I would say, you know, from my perspective as trustee for the fund, I want all of our investments to be considering the ES and the G. As a provider of retirement benefits for um, 1.1 million New Yorkers, um, I want our and all of our investments to be sustainable. So mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think from my perspective we quite see it so segmented or so bucketed out. Um, we, we would like to have all of our investments have a consideration of, of what we consider to be risk factors. Mm -hmm. If you're not adequately assessing uh, the impact of your operations on the, the broad categories of, of, of ESG, then perhaps you're missing opportunities to maximize return. It's, it, it gets back to uh, risk and, and return. Mm -hmm. And again, because we have a perpetual horizon as a pension fund, uh, we want all of our investments to be sustainable. And we think sustainability starts with incorporating ESG considerations. Uh, how do you, though, I guess, make that case? I mean, to of course, the folks that you're effectively working for, meaning yep. the, the pension holders. But as I'm sure you know, there's been a lot of criticism overall, not just of New York State, but other state pension plans, and the way that they've ventured into this. Has the case not been made eloquently enough, accurately enough, that there is a direct financial component there to pursuing these strategies? Well, I, I mean, from my perspective, we made the case eloquently enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, an advantage I have as a, a sole fiduciary model is that you know, I, I, I make the decisions, and the decisions stick until somebody replaces me. Mm -hmm. um, look, Is that going to happen soon? No, it's Is not there something you want to? Okay, I, right. I just got reelected last year. You pause. All right, while. I'm just checking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not ready to collect my pension yet. Um, no, I mean, and and from my perspective, when you see some of what's happening in other states, and you see some of the proposals, that, you know, at the federal level to to limit consideration uh, of ESG. I mean, it, it is unfortunate it's become part of the political uh, landscape. It shouldn't be. And from my perspective as the fiduciary for the fund, um, I want to be left alone to make the decisions, which is my responsibility, uh, to, that investment decisions are in the best interest of our members. That's mm -hmm. our purpose. And so, you know, from my per perspective very strongly, I would be not fulfilling my fiduciary responsibility if, if I was not ensuring that our staff wasn't considering these factors in all of our uh, investment strategy. Again, it's, it's about reducing risk, maximizing return, and, mm -hmm. and so you want to be invested in places where there's an understanding that, that you know, how the environment is being uh, managed, 
how employees are being treated, what kind of board governance structure you have. This will have a direct impact on the, you know, the long-term uh, profitability of, of whatever the company or the investment opportunity is. You can't separate it out. So we get into this labeling and the politics, and, and to me, it's separate from that. Let me, let me just offer this other thought, which may sound counter to some of what you know, we're, some of you may be thinking or talking about today. We don't view what we do as ESG investing. We, we, we are investing to secure retirement benefits, and, and we believe that considering ESG factors is, is totally tied to the effectiveness of our overall investment strategy. It's not like a bucket of mm -hmm. ESG investments. This has to be incorporated in all of your decisions on investment. But that gets to the marketing of this. And I know this isn't necessarily coming from the state pension funds, but right. obviously a lot of the funds, the sure. private funds that you have to work with here. Yes. And we've seen the pushback, and we've seen to a certain extent some of them cave to a certain extent, either removing some of the labels or at least trying to downplay the yeah. ESG aspects of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was at a meeting this morning. Uh, we, we, uh, we were considering an investment, and you know, and the, and the folks that came in said that when um, they go to some other states, mm -hmm. they have to take certain slides out of their presentation. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean they're changing their strategy on incorporating ESG. Mm -hmm. They're just not saying it. Mm -hmm. and, and I do think, look, I think and a lot of it jumped off from, uh, in recent times, the focus on climate and, and the E part of ESG. I, I think you're right. It has been a marketing technique. That's okay, right? Um, but um, it, it shouldn't get in the way of, of, of our continuing to do what we feel we need to do to protect our, our investments and our, and our pensions, and we're, and, and we're not. So I, I don't think the label is as important, and, mm -hmm. and, and we shy away from it, but, um, but we don't shy away from the need to evaluate uh, where we're putting our money and making sure that uh, the corporations we're invested in, or, or even on the private market side, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that these factors are considered. I understand the long-term sustainability factor, particularly for a pension fund, which in, is in effect perpetual. There is still the year-to-year -year returns that, of course, we know everyone focuses on. And it's been harder and harder. It uh, has been exactly. harder and harder for reasons completely unrelated right. to ESG. Right. Does it complicate your job now when we're in a zero interest rate world and everybody's making money and now we're not in that world and you're talking about climate change, you're talking about DEI initiatives and et cetera, how does that play out? Yeah, yeah. No, I think it is more challenging mm -hmm. because I think people are very uncertain and people are very concerned and, and they want to be sure whatever decisions you're making you know, will enhance the bottom line. But it really goes back to you know the underpinnings of our whole philosophy on this. We, we, you know we still believe that the, our bottom line returns will be uh, better protected and in fact enhanced if we continue to evaluate investment opportunities based on these ESG considerations. But you're right, uh, Roman. I will often go to meetings, particularly with retirees, and they'll say, "Are you doing this ESG investing like it's you know?" And it's like. So yeah. what exactly do you mean? Well, I don't know. I, I heard on TV about, yes, I'm very concerned about it. I said, well, I said, don't be. Uh, we're not investing in ESG. We're, we're, we're considering ESG as, 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 as an area of risk. Do we have certain investments that, you know, we maybe what we describe as, as thematic investments, mm -hmm. right? So if we have our part of our portfolio uh, dedicated to climate solutions and sustainability, uh, sustainable investments specifically, $20 billion allocation. But that's, that is a theme. It's not an ESG investment. So the ESG consideration is really how we look at our approach mm -hmm. to investment. It is not the, the what we're investing in. I understood. A lot of people focus on the E the climate change and, and the other a dynamics in that. There's obviously a big focus on the S and some of the social issues as well. I've always felt that some of the low hanging fruit when it comes to ESG is corporate governance. Yet we don't hear as much of a conversation around that as maybe we should. Why not? Well, it's an interesting observation. I, you know, I would say, you know, I've been doing this for a while. When I first started, probably G was what was talked about uh, more so. And then certainly the, the E came up real fast. Uh, on the climate issue, and now I think coming out of COVID, the concern about um, workers and, and worker rights and so on, the S has been elevated, and, and diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion in the wake of George Floyd's murder. 
but it's an interesting question because in many ways the G part you know, again, we, sometimes we, you know, we over-label, over-segment. The, the G part, if you're looking at, I'll say, you know, uh, a board of directors, it's not totally separate from, you know, the, 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 you know, the E and the S. And sometimes we make a mistake to try to pigeonhole it all. So, you know, issues of executive compensation have always been mm -hmm. part of, you know, our corporate engagement, and that continues. The uh, structure of boards, how they operate. What kind of qualifications do you seek out when you're um, recruiting board members? And, and now that's also evolved to the question of how diverse are your boards in terms of women, in terms of racial minorities. We have a new initiative now. We just reached out to corporate boards on the issue of disability inclusion, people with disabilities, LGBTQ issues. I mean, you go down the mm -hmm. list. But, you know, so the, it's not quite so separate, the G, from, from the S. Or, We've, we've been, for years, uh, taking a lead on uh, disclosure of political spending, which, you know, from my perspective, is probably um, as much a G issue as that. You could argue maybe it's an S issue, but... Why is, it, why is that important? Though? Well, because, again, our question is risk, right? So if, if, if you're doing political spending, and I don't mean, you know, what the CEO was doing with their personal money or even a PAC that's been set up, but if you're spending corporate dollars for a candidate or a cause or for a lobbying organization, we, we, you could argue you shouldn't do it at all, but at least disclose where you're putting the money so that we as a shareholder could see whether or not that political spending is promoting a candidate or a cause that aligns with your business plan to maximize the return so it's a good profit for us. Mm -hmm. And, and so we think sunlight, at the very least, by having disclosure is, 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 is a key area. And we, and fortunately so you're not, so you're not opposed problems. to the political spending? Well, it's more the transparency of it? I'll be honest with you. If you ask me my personal opinion, I don't think there should be corporate uh, money with political spending. But, but it, that, since obviously that's mm -hmm. uh, allowed in the law and Supreme Court decisions, at the very least there should be disclosure. How would you reconcile, though, the fact that we know a lot of corporations will basically play both sides of the issue? I mean, I, I've gone through some of these disclosure statements for the companies that do do them, and you'll find just as much money going to the pro side of this issue as the con side of this issue. Well, uh, yeah, and that creates yeah. problems for them sometimes. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I think part of the press, uh, pressure for disclosure has at least had some companies reconsider doing it at all, or certainly scaling it back. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think the fact that there's more scrutiny, I think, has limited, um, you know, limited uh, the, the use of political spending. It would be nice if it was, you know, across the board required disclosure. It's hard for us. I mean, we're in thousands of, you know, obviously thousands of public holdings, to go, you know, company by company to get mm -hmm. disclosure, but. You know, every year we, we, we target a few more and, and we get some more victories. But that gets to the idea here when it comes to the screening criteria. Um, I guess what type of expectations do you put on these companies, whether it's just the passive screening that you're doing or something a little bit more proactive where you actually are going to those boards and those executives and saying, here's what we want. What's the criteria? In terms of how, how we select which yes, ones to? correct. Well, um, so we have a, a, a corporate engagement team, mm -hmm. uh, and I've, I've built out that team over, over recent years. And we have our, you know, our proxy voting guidelines. You know, we lays out our philosophy on, on a host of these issues, and then the team evaluates um, as best they can. Again, given the, the number of, of, of places where we put our money, um, who may seem to be the outliers. Uh, either in terms of poor performance on, on some of, of, of what we're considering, or uh, some of the folks that seem to be better performers, but, but we want a little more information to see if, in fact, they're fulfilling their own stated uh, objectives in this area. And then it really becomes a process of every year then coming up with a list of, of, of companies that you know, we're, we're going to be engaging with, you know, either with letters and meetings or uh, a shareholder resolution, or in some cases, a derivative lawsuit. I think you know the next frontier, though, of challenge in this area, is on the private market side. Mm -hmm. You know, we're obviously it's a different kind of relationship and different kind of engagement. And I, you know, what I've been focusing on more now is at the front end of those kinds of choices about where we put our money. You know, private equity, real estate, infrastructure, whatever. Asking these important questions related, getting back to the topic of ESG, mm -hmm. at the front end before we put our money. You know, with a manager, you know, do, do you have for your investments and your strategy, do you have uh, an ESG policy? Mm -hmm. uh, if so, you know, we have a scorecard, how do we measure that? So 
So it, it, I think that's the next um, frontier in this area is really yeah. taking some of the lessons we learned on the public market side, applying it to the private market. It's harder to do on the private market. Well, because side. once you put your money there, it's hard. You know, it's not like you know. As, I mean, ultimately, as a shareholder, right? You, you, you could do a resolution. You, the ultimate, which we tend to not do very much, uh, is pull your money out, right? To, 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 to do a divestment, choose not to put money there. Mm -hmm. uh, that tends not to be our philosophy. We've done it in a few cases. I don't want to say we haven't, but you know, w when you lock your money up for whatever seven years in a private equity fund, you know, you want to be sure you have the money with a manager that at least is sensitive on these issues so that when you do have to do that phone call saying, hey, by the way, I just got a call from you know, my friends in labor that you know, uh, the workers are not being treated well on, on one of your projects, uh, ho hopefully they would not hang up the phone and say, it's OK, we, we got your money. Mm -hmm. Instead, they'll say, OK, let me look into it and see what we can do to resolve that. Would you still do business if you were screening for a new manager? Uh, a new fund, would you still do business of that with them if they told you explicitly that we're just not, we don't really have an ESG policy or we don't really have a criteria that maybe meets the standard that, that you've had in the past? You know, I don't, I don't know that we've had a hard and fast rule. I can tell you this, going back a few years ago when we first started asking if you have an ESG policy, mm -hmm. uh, the overwhelming majority of the circumstances now is there is an ESG policy. So I think, you know, uh, investors, and not, not just like New York Common, but other investors as well, even asking the question has created a different dynamic. And every now and then, there still are investment opportunities that we're interested in that staff wants to bring to me. Mm -hmm. And and we'll ask the question, they don't have an ESG policy. And you know what, when we ask the question, suddenly they have a policy before we have to make the final decision, which is a good, which is a good thing. But now we've also, we ask more than just do you have a policy, we have a scorecard to really you know, dig it a little bit more into the detail of what the policy is about. Do you think this criteria that your fund has, um, as well as other state funds, do you think it's actually making a difference on those issues? I mean, the short answer I would say is yes, but I think there's still a lot of work to do mm -hmm. across the board. On, on any, any, we could pick any of the issues under, you know, uh, the ESG categories. We know that. Uh, you know, just on the public side, not every uh, corporation is doing what they need to do. Certainly, in terms of from from our perspective, the biggest issue is right, human capital management. You know, how, how many companies still have workplaces that, where discrimination happens, uh, where there are issues of sexual harassment uh, in terms of how employees are being treated. With the renewed push for unionism in our country, uh, we've we've filed a, a couple of resolutions now to request freedom of association to not interfere with workers that want to organize. So just using that one area, if, if you're not treating your employees in the appropriate way, uh, that's going to make uh, your organization not attract and retain the best and the brightest and the most talented and, and not going to get the most out of the employees. So, so we know there are still big gaps in all of these areas, which is why we think it, it's a fundamental part, what will continue to be of our strategy to promote uh, the ESG broad category, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it or not call it, because that's how you make corporate America more responsible and a, a better place to put money and a, a long-term sustainable investment for us. What's the continuity of that strategy, given that, of course, at some point we'll have a new governor, we'll have new politicians in, in uh, Albany who may decide that they want to go in a different direction? Well, certainly the first part is no term limits for state controller, uh, is, is number one. Um, but I think number two is um, keeping the conversation going, because I think there's so much misinformation, and, and, and to the, your earlier points, uh, Romain, uh, misunderstanding about what ESG really means and what it's all about. And, and I, so I think we need to, you know, forums like this, and certainly for the larger public out there, try to depoliticize, you know, what's happened now with this whole discussion. Uh, bec because I think it would be a mistake if, if we allow backward steps in this area. And it would really compromise the ability to maximize return and to reduce risk. That's what ESG consideration is all about. All right. Well, I think that's a good place to end it. You'll make a good politician one day if you ever uh, want they, to run. I, I think they do so. Have I'm still practicing yeah. at it, but, you know, we'll see. <laughs> all right. Tom DiNapoli.